Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to today's first press conference. Uh, as you know, a second press conference will take place at the end of the afternoon on the migration and asylum part of today's council. Um, I would also like to welcome the Dutch Minister of the Interior, Minister Plasterk, but I'll first give the floor to Minister van der Stuur, uh, and then we'll take it from there. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, six months ago, the Netherlands assumed the presidency of the European Union in difficult circumstances. The attacks in Paris and afterwards in Brussels made the urgent necessity for European cooperation yet again crystal clear. The threat of terrorism looms over us to this very day. And that is why it has been the aim of the Netherlands presidency to achieve tangible and swift results that address the concerns of our citizens. Today, we have managed to reach a general approach on the Directive on Firearms. The very swift adoption of this directive is indicative of the great importance the Council attaches to this issue. The new directive achieves the right balance between improving the security of EU citizens and the internal market for legal firearms. The result of the more stringent rules on firearms is that the risk of legal firearms finding their way to the illegal market is reduced. Technical criteria, for example, are now better defined and allow for the prohibition of the most dangerous arms. We have also identified necessary exemptions from the general prohibition, in particular for target shooters. And the traceability of firearms uh, owing to marking requirements, enforced record keeping and enforced cross-border information exchange will improve. The Council's aim is to prevent weapons falling into the wrong hands and the directive marks an important step towards that goal. We have also today endorsed a roadmap to improve information exchange and information management between law enforcement agencies and security services. The roadmap allows us to look at the whole picture of information contained in our systems to tackle terrorism, serious crime and migratory challenges. That will benefit operational investigations as it allows swift and timely provision of high-quality information to frontline practitioners. It means that the security of our citizens can be better safeguarded because police officers, border guards and immigration officers can act more effectively. A key point of the roadmap is our commitment as Council to further step up the feeding and use of EU and international information systems and databases. This progress will be monitored and regular updates will be provided to the Council. It is testimony to our common determination that we have been able to develop and agree on this roadmap in such a short time. We also discussed the sharing of information between intelligence agencies and the work of the counter-terrorism group. An ever-increasing number of countries participate in this counter-terrorism group. My colleague Ronald Plasterk, the Dutch Interior Minister and responsible for the Dutch Intelligence Agency, is here with us today and will briefly touch on this subject in a moment. Ladies and gentlemen, we are dealing with extremism and terrorism, the issue of migration and a complex and fragile situation on the Union's eastern borders. With an active and pragmatic approach to our presidency, we aimed to, that, uh, to address the concerns of our citizens. These are times when many people are looking to Europe for answers and solutions. The outcome of today's meeting shows we can find such answers and solutions when countries work together to overcome problems that we all face. I thank Commissioner Avromopoulos and his staff for our wonderful constructive cooperation and I wish the Slovak Presidency very much success. Minister Plaster. Ladies and gentlemen, the best defense we have against terrorist attacks is to uh, have information on the intention and capability of people to perform such attacks. And therefore, it's crucial that we exchange information within Europe. Now, as you know, uh, the usual basis of collaboration between secret services is bilateral and on a tit-for-tat basis. But what we have created in the counter-terrorism group is a collaboration between 30 countries, the 28 member states plus Norway and Switzerland, where the basis is not um, a need to know, but need to share. So where well, all the information is actively shared when it concerns uh, terrorist attacks or terrorist threats. Um, there has been some call to create a European secret service. 
uh, but we felt and feel that that would involve many years of legislation uh, and would not be the most practical approach to work on the short term and therefore uh, one would need to create a way to share data the same way that they would be shared as if there were one, one agency, um, so be very practical in sharing information. So I can announce, and I'm, I'm glad that I can do that, that we've made important steps with the counter-terrorism group. That involves three aspects. One is there's a platform of intelligence officers of all the 30 participating countries that meet basically all of the time to compare notes, share information, and make sure that the entire system works smoothly. And by meeting, I'm, I mean meeting in person and together. Second, there is a database created in which all participating countries put the information they have on foreign fighters. The database is real time and is available 24 seven. So that way countries know that the information they have is shared by the other countries. And if they want to check something, whether somebody is known anywhere else, they can check that in that database. Third, the um, counterterrorism group has been embedded uh, in the environment of all the other institutions by the decision taken today to have the um, CTG present as a guest in every meeting of the Justice and Home Affairs Council uh, whenever terrorism is on the agenda. So with that, we, uh, without creating a new bureaucracy, without creating new institutions, we do make sure um, that um, the uh, information is shared. And I think that was done by putting the professionals in the lead and having all the politicians in the different countries back up their professionals in supporting what they've done. So, uh, and I should acknowledge that the director uh, of the, uh, the Netherlands uh, Intelligence Service, AIVD, is also the, the uh, leader of the CTG right now, will remain that uh, in the near future, and I greatly appreciate his contribution to that. Thank you for your attention. Commissioner Avramopoulos. Uh, thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, let me start by expressing my thanks uh, uh, and uh, my congratulations to the Dutch Presidency and especially to my good friend uh, Art van der Stoer and uh, Mr. Ronald Plasterk for the excellent work done so far in the field in the area of uh, home affairs. Under, let me say that, very challenging and critical circumstances, many achievements were delivered on security. The agreement on PNR uh, the directive, the work done on improving our information management, the agreement in Council on the Counter-Terrorism Directive, and today's agreement on firearms, all based on Commission initiatives, and in all of these initiatives, the priority has been the fight against terrorism. Today's good news is the Council's common approach on the firearms directive. This issue has been a priority ever since the Paris attacks in January 2015. We want to tighten our rules and leave as little as uh, space as possible uh, for exceptions that criminals can exploit. As we wait the European Parliament's opinion on this, I hope that we can reach a final and solid agreement on this directive in the coming months. Today we also advanced our work on information sharing, building on the ideas the Commission presented back in April. Information sharing is uh, our most effective weapon against the threat of terrorism, and we have to get better at using it. Fragmentation in how we share our information is a source of weakness and vulnerability. And the vulnerability of one member state is the vulnerability of the entire Union. This will remain a clear priority in the near future. The experts group we announced will meet for the first time in a few days to start developing a new approach based on interoperability and interconnectability, in, in connectivity, while, of course, fully respecting EU fundamental rights.
Finally, I want to highlight that Europol has become an important player in supporting member states in their fight against terrorism. The results achieved on the ground, together with the French and Belgian authorities, clearly show this progress. It is now time to make sure that Europol can do even more in supporting all member states in their operational actions against terror. More exchange of information and strategic intelligence is needed. We will continue to work in order to make Europol and its counter-terrorism centre stronger and more effective as announced in our Security Union communication. Looking back at the past six months of the Dutch presidency, and even simply at today's meeting, I see how we have made really good progress. Everyone is fully aware of the momentum that we have to grasp. And of course, I look forward to continuing this excellent cooperation with uh, the Slovak uh, presidency. As I said before, I am sure that uh, our Dutch friends will provide the new presidency with experience, their know-how, and their advices. After all, you understand, especially on these issues, this is about the safety and the security of our citizens. Thank you. I open the floor up for questions. I see Mark Peperkorn, Volkskrant. Good afternoon, Mark Peperkorn, Volkskrant, Netherlands. It's a question for Minister, sorry, Mr. van der Steur and uh, Commissioner Avromopoulos. Regarding the firearms directive, yes, it has been accepted by qualified majority, but it was also one member state who voted against because they said it said it has too many loopholes. So my question is, do you think that the member states maybe ask for too much, too many exceptions and therefore risk the lives of ordinary citizens also too much? Thanks. Well, may if you allow me to answer the first, um, I think that the, um, the compromise we reached on the firearms directive shows that, um, in, particularly in this case where uh, the firearms legislation in several member states are based on traditions, are based on uh, practices that have grown over the years, that uh, we have been able to strike a balance between, uh, the, on the one hand, the security and safety of our citizens, and on the other hand, the existing uh, practices in all those member states. I do feel that we have set a, a very important step uh, in, forward in the right direction with the firearms directive uh, and at the same time acknowledging that those differences within the member states exist. What we've seen is that uh, within council in the discussions there were member states who say this should have, could also have gone a little bit further um, and there are other member states who say this is, has gone uh, too far and basically that's the reason that's why we found the compromise. Well, I don't have anything else to add to what uh, our just uh, said, but it is true that some member states uh, are not very happy with this uh, directive. But, uh, as you know, the majority of member states uh, have agreed uh, on that, and we should never forget that there is a clear request on the conclusions of uh, the European Council on the 18th of December of last year. Uh, and uh, certain member states have already introduced strict conditions concerning uh, semi-automatic firearms, as it is the case, for instance, of the United Kingdom. But we took note of uh, all the remarks made. Excuse me, it's my wife. I would pick it up. But as I said, I took note of the remarks made by. Uh, all member states, and um, uh, we are going to work together in the future in order to overcome all these uh, uh, objections. Finally, as I said before, uh, the purpose we are invited, we are called to serve, is common, how to defend and protect our citizens. Um, so this is the state of play right now, but we are more than happy to see that uh, this initiative finally was approved by the today's Council. Thank you. I saw Austrian television. Swiss television. 
Sebastian Ausdruck, Swiss Television. A, pres a question to the presidency, Mr. Minister von der Stur. There have been specific requests of the Swiss delegation regarding um, semi-automatic weapons used by former servicemen. Can you explain us how the Council met these concerns of the Swiss delegation? Thank you. In, in general, um, we have been discussing uh, many uh, issues uh, on this, um, uh, especially the semi-automatic firearms, because it's a very difficult subject. Um, in many countries, it's, uh, it's already uh, impossible to own such firearms legally. In uh, other countries, it's con to considered to be the tradition that it is possible, especially for hunting or uh, practice shooting uh, purposes. So basically, uh, what we've done is uh, we have acknowledged, and that was also um, discussed today, that um, where those traditions need to be met, uh, that has been done. And I think that was also in the case of, this, of the Swiss. And on the other hand, uh, it still also allows other countries to restrict or to have their own restrictive legislation as they are used to, uh, which will also be the case in the Netherlands. I think I saw the Czech news agency all the way to the back. Well, the main Czech issue with the directive is that it basically creates obstacles for legal, legal users of firearms while the terrorist attacks are done with not registered, uh, not registered firearms. How would you answer to that? Thank you. I think one of the reasons that we uh, discuss this firearms directive is that with what we've seen in the terrorist attacks is that um, some of the uh, firearms that were used were, uh, were deactivated, originally were deactivated legal firearms that were reactivated again. Um, that's one of the problems that we've seen. We've also seen that uh, some of these firearms started their life as a legal firearm and turned into illegal firearms and then ended up in, in, in terrorists, by, by the terrorists. We are all aware that, uh, that, that this is exactly the reason why we need this directive, to step up the legislation, to step up the system of markings, to make it easier um, to uh, detect illegal firearms and to also make it easier to see when a firearm is removed from the legal site and it goes into the illegal site. And that's exactly the reason why we have the, the, system, the system of markings and the uh, the way in all the legislation proposals in place. Do I see any other question? Rick Winkel, Financial Dagblad. Um, a, a, a precise question for Mr. Plosterk on your uh, database for foreign fighters. Would that database uh, prevent the kind of misunderstanding that there was between Belgium and Holland? Uh, about uh, Mr. Al Akrawi, who was sent from Turkey to Schiphol. Um, that's sort of asking me to look back at uh, past events, and I, I don't want to do that. All I can say is that the information that's available uh, for all the uh, services, the secret services in the 30 countries that I mentioned, so the 28 member states plus Norway and Switzerland will be actively shared, including all the information behind that, such as the people that they are connected to, etc. And may I add that one of the objectives of the roadmap that we uh, adopted today is uh, to ensure that the quality of information improves and that also the, uh, the categories of information um, uh, is improved uh, so that the information is more precise. And I think that's one of the uh, important uh, developments that we uh, discussed and reached uh, agreement on today, that information not only in, in size will develop, but it will also develop in quality. I saw a question over there. Rudy Fridi from Al Arabi News Channel. Uh, Minister, can I ask you about the exchange of information? You know, the, this is a critical issue, and it was demonstrated by in Paris attacks and also in Brussels. Under your presidency, what, is, what has been concretely achieved in terms of exchange of information between intelligence services, which is really practical, and everybody knows that it's a very critical issue? Well, thank you for your question. I, and it's, I think there are two things that, um, that uh, come into mind immediately, which is the creation of the Europol Counterterrorism Center, which, is, uh, which started on the 1st of January, was the first thing I did as, uh, in, in, in our presidency. And it's the information center that uh, is run by Europol and is used to connect all the information 
uh, databases and all the law enforcement agencies. That's one. Um, as a result of that, but also as a result of the earlier determination by the ministers uh, after the attacks in Paris and Brussels, uh, we, what we've seen is that the amount of information that's now available is, uh, has doubled or tripled. So there is a, a, the, all the databases have been used, uh, have been filled by many, many, many member states in the past uh, couple of months. And that means that the information system, the information position of the member states, of Europol, uh, of the individual law enforcement and security services has improved immediately, uh, dramatically. And that was necessary. And the second thing is, of course, the counterterrorism group. Uh, it started, um, uh, I think, just prior, before, uh, prior to our presidency, but it certainly has uh, reached, um, uh, as Minister Plastek explained, um, a, a very good basis uh, during our presidency, and it will remain uh, as such. So it's, I think there are th these are three very practical and very um, uh, tangible results of the improvement of information sharing within the European Union. Thank you. Uh, during the last uh, six months, uh, intelligence and information uh, sharing improved um, uh, in a very considerable way. Um, member States have started uh, uh, trusting each other more, and of course Europol is playing a central role on that. Europol was enhanced, was reinforced. 35 more um, uh, people were added to the uh, uh, experts' uh, uh, potential. And uh, as the uh, Minister said before, right now it's, it's functioning as a hub of information with, uh, I would say, very, very positive results. Yes, we have to do more in the future. But it is one of priorities, it was and will remain, uh, to deepen even more the cooperation and the exchange of information among member states, but also among other global stakeholders on what has to do with uh, security. So, yes, during this period we made a progress and we shall keep cooperating and working on that for the future. Minister Plasterk. Maybe it's good to add that, um, um, and, and maybe to explain the, the parallel track check, Tories, where obviously the, the police services work in the legal context where they try to find criminals with the ultimate aim to prosecute them and put them behind bars if there's reason for that because they're guilty of something um, uh, terrible. Uh, while the uh, intelligence services um, work in the context of trying to detect threats to national security with the ultimate aim to provide intelligence information which can then be used to prevent um, uh, anything uh, bad from happening. Now, uh, what we've also done is make sure that those two trajectories within different legal contexts nevertheless work together as closely as possible. And I think we've made important progress also today by embedding the counterterrorism group, which is basically the security services, within the context of the other um, uh, institutions in Europe that work to catch uh, terrorists and, and, and act upon that. I would like to go over to the last question. I don't see any questions anymore. Thank you very much for your attendance and welcome back to the press conference at the end of the afternoon.